Hey, you own a business? Maybe we should consider advertising on the show. See if we can make a little bit of money. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. Our next guest is Giorgio Caffiero. He is the founder of Gulf State Analytics and uh, writes for Foreign Policy and Focus, FPIF.org. Uh, John Pfeffer and the crew over there. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Giorgio? Hey, Scott. I'm great. Thanks for having me on your show. How are you doing? I'm doing real good. Really appreciate you joining us today. Very important article that you've written here, and it's something that I've seen a couple of headlines go by, uh, but not too many. It doesn't seem like people are paying much attention, but the way you paint this story, it's incredibly important. The article is called The Death Sentence That Could Inflame Sectarian Tensions Across the Middle East, and it's about Sheikh well, I'll let you uh, say his whole name correctly and, and let you go from there. Please tell us the story. Sure. Um, last October, a special court in Saudi Arabia sentenced a prominent Saudi Arabian Shiite cleric, uh, Nimre al-Nimre, to death. And he was sentenced to death because of his outspoken opposition to the ruling monarchy in Saudi Arabia. It's... Um, treatment of Shiite Muslims who constitute about 15% of the uh, kingdom's population. And Sheikh Nimre al-Nimre established himself as a very important leader in Saudi Arabia's Arab Spring that erupted in 2011 when other anti-government movements uh, came on the scene in Egypt, Tunisia, and other countries in the region. Um, the Shiite cleric was leading a peaceful, nonviolent movement, and the government wanted to demonstrate that it would not accept any forms of dissent among the kingdom's Shiite population. And this death sentence is sending a very strong signal, not just to Shiites in Saudi Arabia, about the kingdom's firm position, but they're also sending a strong message to Iran and other Shiite actors in the region that the kingdom is not going to compromise at all in its very hardline sectarian position. Mm -hmm. And now you're confident that this man absolutely is a peaceful protester type and, and that the charges against him are trumped up? Yeah, that is... Um, Definitely the understanding of many international human rights organizations, such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. A lot of the charges um, against him um, are very, very strange, such as waging war on God, insulting uh, the late King Abdullah, very, um, very phony charges. Mm -hmm. All right. And now, so it's uh, one of these quirks of, of history and the way things work out. Um, and just guarantees trouble for the long term, I guess, that all the Shiites of the Arabian Peninsula apparently all live right up there in, I guess, the whole thing is tilted towards the northwest, but in what I guess you'd call the northeast of the country. That's where all the oil is and where all the Shiites are, even though they're ruled by uh, the Sunni majority and, and have no property right over that oil respected by the, the kingdom, correct? Yes, the eastern province basically encompasses the entire eastern part of Saudi Arabia, and virtually all of Saudi Arabia's oil is situated in that area, which is equivalent to about one-fifth of the global supply of oil, and pretty much all of Saudi Arabia's Shiites live there too. So it's um, a very uh, it's a very tense standoff between the uh, Shiite opposition and the government, which is very concerned about a revolt erupting in this very strategically vital area of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And politically speaking, they're just completely on the outs and have no power or influence within the royal family, etc.? That is uh, certainly the case. The Shiites are excluded from um, positions of power within the government. They are also... They all, for decades, they have faced discrimination in other areas, such as education, um, 
it is a consensus among analysts that the Shiites of Saudi Arabia are indeed treated as second-class citizens. Mm-hmm. And we all saw what happened with uh, the peaceful demonstrations, uh, or almost, you know, virtually entirely peaceful demonstrations uh, in Bahrain at the Pearl Roundabout there in 2011, when the Saudis just came right across the bridge to put that peaceful protest down. And, and then there's an entire record of uh, the torture, even of doctors who dared to treat the wounded protesters. And, and I guess that clamp down uh, continues. I don't know if the Saudi uh, forces are still in Bahrain to that degree. I know the Americans are. <laughs> but as far as uh, the Saudis helping them uh, repress the, the people of Bahrain, uh, they sure got that work done in 2011. Yeah, there is an important connection between the situation in the eastern province and the situation in neighboring Bahrain, just connected to the eastern province by a 16-mile causeway. Um, Many of the Bahraini Shiites, as well as Saudi Shiites, have expressed solidarity with one another, and they both view their own groups as uh, dealing with a very similar plight. These are oppressed Shiites who are living under U.S.-backed Sunni monarchies, who are unwilling to allow the Shiites any sort of power in the country. And one of the main reasons why the Saudis were so quick to send their security forces into Bahrain back in 2011 is because they were concerned of the implications of a Shiite revolution in Bahrain for Saudi Arabia's own eastern province. And I actually uh, traveled to Bahrain in August last year, and when I went to the island of Sitra, which is really the heart of this uh, anti-government uprising in Bahrain, there were posters of Sheikh Nimre on Nimre on just walls and street corners. Mm-hmm. And I think you say in the article, they're all painted over now, right? And and the government's trying to crack down on even signs of support for them. Oh, absolutely. The um, There has been some graffiti, uh, you know, calling for Sheikh Nimre al Nimre to be freed. And the Bahraini authorities indeed uh, have painted over much of that graffiti all over the walls. And now one thing that's really interesting that you talk about in here, Giorgio, is uh, how partly this is just domestic politics um, in the kingdom, the 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 uh, king and his ministers protecting their right flank from those who would criticize them for stabbing ISIS in the back after helping to uh, you know generate the rebellion in Syria. And now America si- insists they leave them high and dry, and so they're backing off their support, and so. They have their right wing critics. And so they kind of appease them by saying, "Okay, well, here we'll, uh, you know, persecute this Shiite uh, leader over here in our own country. That's absolutely correct. Uh, Last fall, Saudi Arabia and three other uh, Gulf Sunni states joined the U.S. led military campaign against ISIS in Syria, Uh, Saudi Air Force bombed some of the ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra targets over there. And this actually led many conservative Saudis to criticize their government, because from their perspective, Saudi Arabia, by bombing a Sunni group in Syria while not attacking the Assad regime, is essentially, according to them, aligning Riyadh with Iran and Hezbollah And the government in Saudi Arabia is very worried about more conservative elements of Saudi society becoming increasingly angry with the government. Um, And you're absolutely right that the death sentence is sending a message to a domestic audience that while Saudi Arabia... I'm sorry, Georgia. Hold it right there. We'll we'll be right back, y'all. Hey, y'all, run out and get a copy of Embedded Alive. First Person Journalism in the United States of America, 2013 through 14, by Chris Braswell. The book takes a gonzo look at daily life in America, columns, informational letters, and other marketplace vigilance, a look at drug abuse culture and its marketing, and a series of contemplative and metaphysical essays. Get Embedded Alive, 
First Person Journalism in the United States of America, 2013 through 14, in paperback, hardcover, and digital formats at FusePowder.com. All right, guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show, The Scott Horton Show, scotthorton.org for all the archives. I'm talking with Giorgio Cafiero, founder of Gulf State Analytics, about his piece at, uh, well, you can find it at Common Dreams and at, uh, I think we ran it as an original on antiwar.com as well, uh, Foreign Policy and Focus, FPIF.org. It's called The Death Sentence That Could Inflame Sectarian Tensions Across the Middle East. And it's about this Saudi Shiite sheik, Nimre. And uh, I'm sorry about the heartbreak and the, the bad time in there, uh, Giorgio, but uh, you were just finishing up talking about how uh, the Saudi uh, royal family they have political forces on their right and that they're uh, partly appeasing them uh, by persecuting this guy because at the same time, in their eyes, the Saudis are ceding the Iraqi battlefield to the Iranians at American insistence. Absolutely. This I guess thought. I should have said and or the Syrian battlefield as well there. Right. Uh, there's definitely a perception from some uh, Wahhabi extremist circles in Saudi Arabia that the government has become, quote unquote, soft on Shiism. And the government certainly does not want more Wahhabi Saudis to turn to ISIS or become incredibly or become increasingly sympathetic to ISIS. So this death sentence certainly sends a message that the government remains committed to clamping down on Shiite descent. I think um, an important point to note, though, is that if the Saudi Arabian authorities were to go ahead and execute uh, Sheikh Nimre al-Nimre, there would be a very, there would likely be a very dangerous backlash, uh, not only within Saudi Arabia's eastern province, but also in other countries in the region where there are large Shiite populations that revere the Shiite cleric who is now on death row. Well, and I think uh, you say in the article there's already been attacks in Bahrain attributed to backlash from just his sentencing, correct? Yes. there Some reports have surfaced that some Shiite militias in Bahrain have uh, waged certain attacks and have threatened to uh, attack U.S. Marines, uh, let's keep in mind that the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet is based in Bahrain, so you have many U.S. military personnel in the Persian Gulf Island Kingdom, and uh, some of these uh, Shiite militias have also threatened uh, Saudi nationals, who um, you know they refer to as the occupiers of Bahrain. And in Iraq, there are some Shiite militias, as well as in Yemen, who have stated that there will indeed be consequences for Saudi Arabia if they were to go ahead and execute the Shiite cleric. Wow. Hey, can you tell me uh, how this guy ranks compared to, say, the Ayatollah Sistani or uh, somebody with a lower level credential like uh, Muqtada al Sadr? The Iranian government media and religious establishment call Sheikh Nimre al-Nimre an Ayatollah, messenger of God. And in Shiism, that is the highest rank for a religious authority. So this would be like if they were to execute Sistani or to put a death sentence on Sistani. It's that level of a offense to the to the Shiite population. It's, it would be an incredible. It's an incredibly sensitive issue. Wow. You're abs absolutely right. Wow. This would really enrage many Shiites all over the world. Wow. And um, you know, it's funny. I was reminded of uh, when I was reading your article of the WikiLeaks from the heroic Chelsea Manning doing 35 years in the brig for us right now still, um, where uh, the king says to George Bush, I don't understand. It was always you, me, and Saddam against Iran to contain the Iranian revolution. Now you're going to give Iraq to Iran on a golden platter, he said. And so that's really, they. I don't know why Bush thought that the Saudis would just I mean, obviously, they had to accept the fact America was going to do the war, but they didn't have necessarily have to accept the fact of the results. They've been financing the Sunni base insurgency ever since then, really. And uh, if they've backed off now, that would be the new news, I guess. Yeah, it's uh, certainly the case that the fall of Saddam 
was understood in Riyadh as a major loss to Iran. And the Saudis really think that the Americans made a huge blunder. You mean a and, boon to Iran, a loss to them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and this partially explains why the Saudis were so aggressive to send their security forces into Bahrain back in 2011. And Riyadh certainly did not seek a permission slip from Washington, D.C. before doing so. In their opinion, uh, the fall of the Sunni Khalifa family in Bahrain would constitute another country on Saudi Arabia's borders falling to supposedly pro-Iranian forces. Mm -hmm. And right now in um, Yemen, the Saudis are very worried about the Houthis gaining power. And in their, from their perspective, uh, recent developments in Yemen indicate that Iran is gaining even more influence in yet another country on Saudi Arabia's borders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was just going to ask you about is the victory of the Houthis there. And, uh, and I guess politically how that plays in to the situation in i guess in other words the uh domestic politics in saudi arabia uh, seem to be determining that they keep making matters worse or i don't know what do you think of the chances they're actually going to carry out the beheading and crucifixion of this guy's corpse as you say is the sentence here um many experts doubt that the saudi arabian authorities will actually execute the cleric, uh, some people have said that the Saudis often like to show the sword without having to use it. It's just a, a matter of speculation. But given all the security risks uh, associated with the execution of this cleric, I think um, it's very possible that the Saudis are just trying to send a message. And uh, I, w I would be surprised if they actually executed the cleric, but uh, these things are very difficult to predict. Mm -hmm. Now, to what degree is Iran really behind the Houthis? I mean, they must be sending them some money and guns, but if you listen to Charles Kruthammer, this is the rise of the Iranian Empire, and not because he lied us into war with Iraq, never mind that. <laughs> yeah, um, listen, the Houthis practice a form of Shia Islam, and like most Arab Shiites, they do have a connection with the Islamic Republic of Iran. There are links between the Iranian regime and the Houthis. Yet at the same time, it's important for your viewers to understand that Yemen is the poorest Arab country. And a lot of the people fighting in Yemen will accept money from anyone. And just because the Houthis have maybe taken some money, possibly some arms from Tehran, does not mean that they are a proxy of Iran. The relationship between the Houthis and Iran, for example, is very different than the relationship between Lebanese Hezbollah and Iran. And at the same time, given the fact that the Houthis are dealing with many legitimate local grievances, I don't believe that Iran is the reason why they waged a rebellion against the U.S.-backed government in Sana'a. Even if the Islamic Republic of Iran had no relationship with the Houthis, there's still reason to believe that this uprising would have occurred. Now, there are many neoconservatives who have their ulterior motives uh, with Iran and have an interest in making people think that the Houthis are an agent of Iran, um, and they would like people to think that Iran orchestrated a coup against a U.S.-backed government in Yemen to use this as further uh, you know, justification for ending the nuclear negotiations with Iran. So as I said, there are um, plenty of people in Washington, D.C. with ulterior motives who are inaccurately representing events in Yemen. And Giorgio, I'm sorry, I just remembered that uh, you're in a hurry and, and need to go. So uh, I'll let you go right now. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I hope we can do this again sometime soon. Yeah, I really appreciate it. It's been great. Thanks hey, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, Giorgio Caffiero, find it at Common Dreams at antiwar.com at fpif.org. It's called The Death Sentence That Could Inflame Sectarian Tensions Across the Middle East. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here. 
It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Roberts & Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, and they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Roberts & Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future of Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Horenberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you. Hey, all Scott here. If you're like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it taste good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at DarrenSCoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. DarrenSCoffee.com. Use promo code Scott and you get free shipping. DarrenSCoffee.com. 